All right, looks like we're going. I can set this up. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Dan, for joining us. Um, as, as you know, we're going to be talking about uh, your campaign for your school board for Fort Zumwalt School District. Um, most uh, of our questions have come from the community itself. We had an open uh, form that people could fill out. Uh, and then we do have some questions that are more general um, and also focusing on mental health as um, the Find the Light Foundation is focused on mental health specifically in the Zumwalt School District. Mm -hmm. So our first question is going to be kind of, uh, how, if you can tell us about yourself and your campaign. Uh, so I'm originally from Huntsville, Alabama. We came to the O'Fallon area in 2014 when I got a job with Amtrak. Um, we came here from Kansas. I've been stationed out there while I was on active duty. Um, daughter was born out there, but she wasn't school age until she actually got uh, here. Um, she actually started in the Fort Zumwalt uh, Early Education Center when she was three. Uh, she was a micro preemie, so she was um, a little, um, I'm trying to think of the word. She had some speech problems and some, uh, uh, she went through speech therapy, physical therapy, and occupational therapy to get her where she needed to be with all the other kids. And we've been very happy with the school district um, since we've been here. Um, Education wise, my wife has got a bachelor's degree from the University of Central Florida. I myself have a, an associate's from the Community College of the Air Force, uh, a bachelor's degree from Peru State College in Peru, Nebraska, and a master's degree from Peru State College in Peru, Nebraska. Wow. All right. Uh, so, why did you decide to run for school board? A lot of it came from frustration trying to help our daughter with her math uh, when she got into first grade. Um, I'm not sure if they're calling it Common Core anymore, but it was basically everything that my wife and I had learned was suddenly wrong. Um, and when we tried to show her the ways and there were certain things we were told weren't efficient enough. And a lot of it came from frustration from that. And it's like I wanted to address uh, curriculum issues because different kids learn differently. Uh, my style of learning is a lot different from my wife's and my daughter's is going to be a lot different from other kids that are in the school system. So I didn't want the one way that the school might be teaching to be the carte blanche end all be all. This is how we're going to do it because different kids are going to learn differently. If you can get to the answer and show your work of how you did it. Um, you know, I want to make sure that curriculum wise that we're, we're taking into account. There are a lot of different ways kids learn. Um, then it kind of evolved into making sure having the answer, that was the big one that got me into it. Uh, and then after that, it turned into when I started getting questions from different organizations, what are your plans for this or for that? It's, it's wanting to make sure the school board is run properly. And I don't have any issues with the school board. I'm probably one of the few candidates ever that doesn't have a problem with the way things are. I've got, you know, certain things I want to look at, but making sure that the school board continues to run from my opinion, pretty well. Um, and, but looking at the way the budget decreases are going, making sure that if cuts have to be made that before we have to lay anybody off, that we make sure that there's another avenue we can take to try to address the issue, to try to keep as many quality people on as we can. Absolutely. Uh, so actually our first question from the community is gonna be right up your alley then. Uh, how are you going to advocate for and support special education and related service providers in the district? It's imperative and sp special education because it, it's not just um, so much in the form of, uh, how do I call it? Trying to make sure I get the word right. It's not, when I was growing up, it's geared towards one thing that developmentally there might be something different about the student but it's grown into so many different things now that it's not just a, uh, you know, it's not so narrow that this is either you're in it or you're not. There's a lot of kids that are in special education services for various things. Um, the early education center was great. We started out with United services and it went to the early education center. We've had nothing but positive experiences with it because they're taking into consideration all the kids that, were in there and my daughter was in a class when she would go 
and she was only half day there were kids all across the it was a wide range of different things and they worked with her and they've got her where she needs to be and she still struggles with math but neither i'm not a math person so as she comes by it honest um but we've got tutors that are uh, one of the high school students is tutoring our daughter now. So it's making sure that like we get, we, we identify what issues there are. It's not a problem. It's, it's, it's just a difference. Uh, making sure we identify the differences early so that we can make sure the kids get what they need as early as possible. We don't want to find something when they're in third, fourth and fifth grade. And now we've got to try to figure out how to best catch them up. If we can identify these things early and get them taken care of and make sure they stay on the same track, then we're in much better shape than if we find it late. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so our next question is going to be, uh, how are you going to support teacher salaries being more aligned with other districts to keep experienced staff who've worked for the district long term? You've definitely got to fight for them. And there's a lot of lobbying that has to be done at the state level because you're constantly having to fight for funding. Um, I went to a th uh, function with the school board. It was a candidate function. And one of the current school board members that's not up for re-election this year explained it that, and I, I really liked his analogy, is like if you get a jar that's a gallon one year and it's full of money, but the next year it's a half gallon jar, the people giving the money are going to say, we gave you plenty of money. But you're looking at that's half of what we got or, you know, it's less. So it, it's constantly lobbying and letting them know that, hey, we've got these quality teachers, but they can run off to other school districts because I don't blame them. If we can't pay you what you deserve or what you can make at uh, another district, if you're going to move up and you're, you're, you've got to take care of your family first. I get we want you to stay here, but you've got to take care of your family first. So we've got to fight with the state legislature, with the federal government to make sure we can get the funds we need to try to keep them here. And it's not just a problem that's with the schools. There's a lot of careers like that. Law for, law enforcement's especially hit with that right now where smaller cities can't pay, so they're going to other cities that can. Um, and it's the same thing, just fighting with the government. And a, let me not say fight. Um, convince them that this is where the money needs to go. Uh, so going and if you got to harass the state legislator to like, look, you know, just keep banging on their uh, door and ringing their phone, trying to make sure the money's getting there. That way you can hold on to the quality teachers. So going off that, there's actually another uh, question from Kelly Henderson, uh, who is an M a Mid Rivers Elementary and South High School teacher and parent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so going off of that, how would you use your position to advocate for teachers uh, within the district for say, you have that half gallon of, of money how, how can you advocate uh, to make sure it's allocated in a way that you personally deem uh, acceptable? <clears throat> Excuse me. When you look at, if, if you're getting reductions in things, you've got to, and you know, okay, we've got to make cuts instead of just saying, okay, you know, these are the ones that are gone that I, I hate doing it that way because there's always a difference we can do. It. The federal government is really bad about, Things that we needed 20 years ago, if we needed 15 people to run a job, that worked 15 years ago. But now with computers and everything, you can get it down to one people. Well, instead of just eliminating those positions as they, through natural attrition, they keep filling the job. So we keep paying the money. So what we need to do is when it comes time to start making cuts, we need to take a look at, okay, so let's say North High School and South High School if the student numbers are changing from one high school to another and we've got one teacher position open at South high school, but the numbers are going down at North, do we need to move a teacher instead of filling a position and running the risk of cutting somebody off uh, after we hire them? We make the moves we need to make, not just keep hiring and filling. Let's move people around and they might not like it. I understand people get attached to their schools and I totally get it, but Instead of hiring on, let's see what moves we can make first to accommodate the needs of the school. I don't want to cut anybody off if we don't have to. Keep everybody on. And if a job doesn't necessarily absolutely have to be filled, let's not fill it. Let's take a look at the numbers, reevaluate, and move people around as we have to so that we can keep them employed. Yeah, okay. 
so our next question is going to be, aside from the business aspects of the district and how the districts run, what kind of ideas do you have to help students be successful and well-rounded before they graduate high school? So maybe uh, not so much in an academic sense, but learning other skills to help them transition into adulthood. I'm, I love technical education. I never took part in it. There were other things that I was doing that technical education, but going back, I kind of wish I had. I, I didn't acquire any special skills. Um, and there's, there's a saying that, you know, there, some people will say college isn't for everybody. And I, I absolutely hate that. College is for everybody. It may just not be for somebody now. So you may not be ready for college. When I was 18, as much as I thought I was ready for college, I wasn't. I did much better as a 35-year-old going to graduate school than I did as a 20-year-old going to community college in Alabama. But some students are really, really good at the technical stuff. They're good at the hands-on. They may not be good at doing this Excel spreadsheet, but they can fix a car or they can weld or they can, they've got those mechanical skills that are really, really in need right now. So making sure we got good technical programs in place so that students can do what they can. So there's not just college isn't the only avenue. And the military isn't for everybody. I'm, I'm a military guy and I love the military, but it's not for everybody. So making sure there's more than just, okay, college or the military or that's it. And that's, that's never always it. But you want to bro uh, widen their uh, – choices as much as possible. And if you can give them something that's going to give them a good skill uh, to go out into the world, that's the best we can do for them. Absolutely. So this next question is from a North Middle parent uh, who wanted to be anonymous. Uh, they said, how would you address concerns in the community? Uh, in previous board meetings, letters were read with no acknowledgement or return response to stakeholders. So how would you address concerns in the community? I would be extremely perturbed if I had sent something to the school board and not heard anything back from it. Um, and the thing is, is I, I'm a stakeholder, they're stakeholders. I, I think that's the big thing for me right now is because my student is a Fort Zumwalt student. So I'm invested. My wife's invested. The family's invested. This is, we want to make sure if our daughter benefits from it, every student benefits from it. If there's a problem that needs to be addressed, I might be a little hard to get a hold of sometime, but I check my email constantly. I'll get back through email. If I'm not aware of what they're talking about, you can readdress it to me and I'll bring it up when I can. But I would be livid if I sent something. It was, it's, I understand that it may not seem important in the big picture, but it might be the most important thing to that parent. So it's, it's got to be addressed. If there's anything I can do to make you feel at least a little bit better about it or that I'm going to look at it. I don't, I hate being left in the dark and I know other parents do too. So it doesn't take a whole lot to try to figure out what it is because it might be one parent contacted the board about it, but there might be other students having similar issues. So you're not always just addressing one family. You're just addressing a problem that might have been brought up by one family that, that many people are experiencing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and going off of that, uh, how, do, how would you plan on addressing concerns from students uh, as uh, well as parents? The same way. Um, I'd probably need to establish an official email, which I'm sure I'd get. Excuse me, but I check email. Email is my primary way of communication with my jobs and everything that I've got going. I'm not always reachable by phone, but I've always got two thumbs to type with on the phone or I'm at a computer. So I can check through emails. It just hit me up on the email and I'll establish an actual, you know, board member Facebook page and be more active on it than I have on my campaign page. Um, but hit me up and I'll address it the best I can. I can't make, you know, I can't sit here and like, yes, I will do this. I'll do that. I'll work on it. You can't always make promises. That's, you know, that gets people's expectations too high, but I can promise you I'll take a look at things. I can't always promise the resolution you want, but I'll, I'll look at it. Awesome. Uh, so our next question 
is uh, from Justin Singer from Fort Zumwalt South. And he says, what plans do you have regarding student mental health in the future? Mental health is a much better understood uh, issue than it was when I was in high school back in the 90s. Um, and it's not just limited to one group. It's an issue in the military. It's an issue with students between uh, bullying and everything else. The big thing I want students to understand is that if you need to talk to somebody, it's okay. We're not, I'm not going to judge anybody on if you need to go talk to somebody. I encourage people. So we can set up, there are a lot of programs in play. I'm not a counselor, for instance, but you, if you need help, you can come to me and we'll find the resources. So we need to make sure the students are aware of the resources that are available, whether it's a phone number or it's if you go talk to the counselor, if we make sure they've got set up with, they've got the list of resources. The big thing is understanding student mental health is important, not because it has to be addressed now. It's, it's a growing issue, but once again, it's better understood. But part of the problem is making sure the stigma is removed from it. That's a bit, if we can get students or anybody to go talk to somebody to get the help they need, that's the first step in addressing it and making sure we've got a list of resources that anybody can go to is a big part of making sure that we can address it as a school system and as a community. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely a community-wide thing. Uh, and it also involves um, acknowledging when there are, are problems that arise. Right. Uh, so that's good to hear. Our next question is from a parent at DeBray Middle School. So uh, this is very relevant to the curriculum that their kids are seeing right now. Uh, the American Medical Association, Academy of Pediatrics, and the CDC all recommend evidence-based and comprehensive sex education programs be offered to students. Will you, as an elected board member, address the need for comprehensive sexual education and also acknowledge that the current program, Thrive, is not comprehensive? It's a touchy subject because as yes, a parent, I want to be able to deliver to my child what we think is appropriate. That being said, I'm not an expert in anything medical or otherwise. So sometimes it's, I don't have a good answer with this because I would not feel comfortable not being there when my student was being talked to about this. And it was something, you know, we didn't touch till I got to high school when you, in Alabama, you're mandated a health class and this was kind of part of it, but it was very basic and, I think first we got to make sure the parents know what to tell the kids, but it, me personally, I'd be very uncomfortable with somebody else talking to my kid about it at school when I'm not there. And then you have to determine at what age is the appropriate age. So is there an age or a grade that they're doing this program in or recommending this program in? Uh, I'm not sure about the specifics. I know when I was going through the Zimbabwe school district, we had a fifth grade kind of, overview of just puberty and then in middle school uh what middle school and early high school they started getting a little bit more in depth but okay. it, the program we had was was also pretty uh pretty superficial i <laughs> i missed that day it was fifth grade in alabama too but i missed that day because i never got the permission so i missed all the stuff that i missed all the jokes that fifth grade boys were talking about um Students need comprehensive education in this, but I'm not sure it's something I want the school systems addressing. Just because from a personal standpoint, I don't feel comfortable about it. I'd rather my wife and I discuss things with our daughter, but there are also other religious aspects that you have to take into consideration because from a lot of you know different religions in the area and across the country now, and it's some religions are very specific on how they want to address it. Or I'm not sure. I, I, the superficial stuff is, gosh, this is a hard one. Just because, like, I I would have a hard time with my daughter going to school. Then, Daddy, what's this? It's like, oh, you know, so it's, it's that's the government 
so the libertarian in me says that's the government trying to mandate how we live our lives. So I don't want it. The dad in me is just like, I'd rather this is a personal issue between for the family to address. And that okay. was a very long winded and non answer answer, but it's the, that's a, that's a, that's a difficult one. So. Yeah. Yeah. That one's, that one is definitely um, a little more in the weeds. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll do another middle school question um, from a parent at North Middle. Uh, it says, how can we have more consistency between North, South, West, and East in our school district, lesson plans, start times, programs uh, offered for students, et cetera? I wasn't aware that there was a difference in the start times for schools. Um, I would... We have to establish what the curriculum is. That should already be established and what levels you take it on. Um, if it's not, we definitely need to take a look at it uh, because a freshman at South is learning something different from a freshman at North um, or West or East. If, if the freshmen aren't all learning the same thing, we can't really gauge what the progress is for the students. Uh, so we definitely need to look at the curriculum and the timelines. Uh, to make sure everybody's on the same page. And there was part of it was about start time. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know enough about uh, start time to give you background information on that. Um, I have heard from parents that uh, things like AMI days uh, mm -hmm. are not super consistent throughout the district and oh. um, various kind of planning things. Oh, I see. So like if, if one school's on a Wednesday a and I, AMI day and another one's on a Thursday, it's, um, or, um, if one school says you have, you have X amount of work to complete in a day and another school says you have X amount of work to complete by the end of the week. Right. Yeah. It, I think it's gotta be standardized, especially if you've got kids in multiple schools, it can be difficult when everything is different. Um, I was a little thrown off when we our school when I was growing up, school started at eight o'clock every day and it went to a three fifteen. And then we get here and school starts at nine and goes to four. Um, and I don't even know if that's for every school in the system. Um, no, as you get older, you get up earlier. <laughs> OK, uh, I would. And I can understand that for traffic issues that you might want, you know, if you've got students driving that you might want them to avoid. Honestly, I would rather see the high school or start a little later so they can avoid the rush hour traffic so that it's just students concentrating instead of, you know, okay, I'm trying to get to work and there's a high school student. Um, but I can understand parents that have kids in multiple schools that you're going to want some consistency that way. Okay, I've got to drop you off first and I've got to drop you off right after. Um, but at the same time, it's, there's a lot to take into consideration about traffic issues and everything else, you know, with the school locations being what they are. I know that with South being at Mexico and Bella Creek, the traffic may be a little heavier than it is for North on Tom Ginniver. Um, but it's definitely something we can take a look at, trying to make sure all the, the days are scheduled the same way. That way you don't have one kid off at one time and one at another and trying to get the everything as close to scheduled as we can, the schedule's as close as possible for start times, just to make sure it's easier on parents and they're not having to wait, you know, drop one off, then wait an hour to drop another one off, uh, if that makes any sense. So. Yeah. I've only uh, got so, one, it's kind of easy for us, so. <laughs> that does make things a little bit easier, yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, we're gonna move into kind of some background questions um, and more specific policy questions. So uh, why should the Fort Zimbabwe community uh, pick you for one of the two seats that are open for election? I'm a hard worker and I guess that's kind of a cliche answer. It, it, and I am a dad and I'm not a past dad, I'm a current dad. So I understand certain things that are going on right now. Um, I've been really happy with the school district. And like I said, I've got no complaints with the way things are right now. We've been really, really happy with our experience uh, for the whole family with the school district. Um, but you, you'll have some members that they may not have had a child in the schools for some time. So there's going to be a little bit of a gap there um, between the way it was and the way it is now. Um, you know, I'm living in the present. And I may not be the best candidate. I'm not going to, you know, like I said, I'm, 
I don't have a whole lot of complaints and I'm very bad at campaigning. I won't raise money because people need their money and I don't want signs all over the place because it gets obnoxious. It just, I'll work hard. I will. I'm, I got, I keep a lot of my plate all the time, but I like a lot of projects and it's, this is something that, like I said, it benefits, if it benefits my child, it benefits a lot of kids. Um, so while I'm working to make sure everything is good for my kid, I'm simultaneously making sure to work, make sure everything is good for everybody in the system, because I have to make sure that, uh, let's see, she's in second grade now. So 10 years down the line, when my daughter's getting ready to graduate from high school, that everything has been set up for her to be in place for her to be ready to move on to whatever her next step is and whatever the next step is for all the kids ahead of her and all the kids that are coming behind her. Absolutely. Uh, so my next question is how should uh, your role as potential board member relate to the role of the superintendent? You've got to work closely with him just to make sure that everything's running smoothly because the superintendent is the day-to-day -day guy. Um, it, or day-to-day -day person, it's Dr. Dubray right now, but it's, you know, the day-to-day -day person. Um, school board members, you know, meet the third Monday of the month and they might have a little bit here and there that they have to do elsewhere, but the superintendent oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the school board. So making sure you're in communication with him that if they've got any issues that come up or if you have any issues that come up that you can communicate with them. Um, so just make sure you kind of understand, if, if they implement a policy, kind of make sure you understand what the P's and Q's are behind it. Uh, in, the, in the work I've had, there's a reason for every policy and every rule. So just making sure you understand why something is being done and it's not just change for the sake of change uh, is imperative. Yeah, definitely. So uh, going off of that, I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, I lost my place. Oh, uh, <laughs> what do you think is the best way to address differences between differences of opinion on the board or between uh, the board and the superintendent or other administration? There is always compromise. If it, if you're if you're you know this far to this side and this far to this side, somewhere in the middle, there's something that y'all can agree on. There's never an issue that you can't find a middle ground on because there's always something that somebody doesn't like, no matter what it's going to be. If you want pizza for dinner and somebody wants pepperoni and the other wants sausage, well, we can get half and half. There's something there that you can find the middle ground that meets everybody's not going to be hundred percent happy hundred percent of the time, but you've just got to work it out to find out what that middle ground is. There was a graduate school project, um, our instructor assigned us to, it had something to do with dates, like a date farm. Well, we're competing with another student. She, we were paired up with another student. We're competing to get these dates. Well, as we were reading through, we're like, wait a minute, I just need the pit and you need the meat of the fruit. So we were able to compromise. Okay. You get the meat, then I'll get the fruit or whatever it was. And it, Sometimes it's something as mundane as that, that you can just find, okay, well, you want the meat and I need the pits. So let's find out how we get to that point so everybody's needs can be met as best they can. Okay, and then um, a similar question. Uh, Fort Zimmel is a very, very large district. Obviously, uh, you're well aware that there's always going to be people that agree with what the board is doing and people who don't. Right. So uh, how should the board address differences of opinions with community members? Again, it kind of goes back to what the question about the superintendent is making sure it's not change for the sake of change. Um, making sure everything is well reasoned that when somebody asks, why are you doing this? You need to be able to articulate why you're doing it. Just say, well, it, it needs to be done is not a, a good answer for anybody. You're not meeting anybody's needs by saying, well, it needs to be done. Okay, why does it need to be done? You need the five W's and the H, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Why are we changing the policy? How are we going to implement it? What's the timeline on the policy? Sometimes policies aren't an immediate thing. It's a, it's a graduated thing where you, it goes on a little bit at a time. 
Um, making sure to answer the questions as fully as you can, not leaving anybody in the dark. Um, I, I can't stand when supervisors do that for me, and I don't like to be a supervisor that does that. Just why are we doing this? Okay, here's why. So not not doing anything just for the sake of change. Not you know we're not going to change the we're not going to change Fort Zumwalt North school colors just because I don't like green or just to change it to something different. It's make everything. There's a reason for everything, and make sure everybody knows because if they know the whys, they tend to be more accepting of change. Hey. Okay. It's a pretty good answer. Um, so my next question is uh, this year and actually throughout um, at least my tenure in Fort Zumwalt, uh, I graduated in 2014, there has been some issues uh, that were highly publicized with uh, homophobia in the district and specifically bullying uh, of, of people who identify as, um, as LGBT or queer or any, anything that isn't um, anything that isn't straight mm -hmm. and um so as a board member what role do you have to protect um groups like that well first and foremost i was raised in a very conservative household i did not inherit the conservative genes from my family it's through a lot of experiences in my life i've learned that it doesn't matter what how you live it it doesn't if it doesn't affect me i it doesn't bother me too much and that sounds like kind of backing off, but it's it's accepting everybody for their differences. I don't see the same way as everybody. We don't all believe the same things and I don't live my life the same way as everybody else. But first and foremost, you need to leave, be allowed to live your life the way you see best fit for you. I, I can't tell you how to live your life and I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. Whatever works for you, works for you because what works for me doesn't work for everybody either. Um, to make a lot of it is making sure that students understand the differences is like, that's what makes us great because you can learn something from everybody. You can learn tolerance from somebody, but you can learn love from somebody. It's not relegated to just any one group of people. Um, so I really don't know how to address the bullying issue. I, it's it's really, really hard for me to, to, I don't have a good answer for it. I, I can tell my daughter, you be nice to everybody because everybody's different. You don't know what somebody has going on in their life. And they might be a little different, but that's not bad. Um, I, I, I wish I had a better answer for how to address bullying. And I've tried to look at it before. I just, I cannot, because a bully sometimes has to be bullied in order to fix their ways, but bullying back is not a way to address it. You know, when I was growing up, it was, all right, if they hit you, you smack them right back in the mouth. They'll leave you alone. So it's, it's, but that only exacerbates a problem. Uh, but I mean, the big thing is understanding that making sure the students understand just because you don't agree with something doesn't make them a bad person. That's the biggest thing is like, everybody's going to be different. What works for you may not work for everybody. I don't know how you get that into students and make it stick because students are, you know, teenagers are stubborn. I don't want to say students are stubborn. Teenagers are stubborn. I was, and it, I, I had to grow up quite a bit. And unfortunately it's, it's a process that's really, really complicated and I don't have a good answer for it. Okay. Um, uh, this question might be, might be kind of up your alley based on, on what you've said so far. So uh, how does a school board, how should a school board balance the need to provide a quality education with uh, the need to respond to taxpayer burden? the some years it's going to be good some years it's going to be bad and i i don't want to tax anybody to death to try to get um uh, get give everybody the best education um but again it goes back to making sure you're spending the money right so that if you do i really really would not want to bring up okay let's we're going to start a meal tax to do 
this, that, or the other, making sure that we've got everything situated the way it needs to be. Like I said, making cuts where they can be made without having to lay people off. Um, looking for hunting for grants, uh, because there's always a lot of grants out there hitting up the state government as much as we can, but that's still hitting taxpayer dollars. Uh, just making sure everything's managed that if you have to make cuts, do it wisely. Um, you can get a quality education by pinching pennies, but you're not going to get quite as good. You just got to make sure the money's managed correctly. And like I said, if you have to start laying off teachers, the quality education goes with the teachers because those are teachers who have learned through years of, of working, how students pick up on things. My third grade teacher who I'm still friends with, she figured out how to make things work on a dime. And it was, you know, things, she thought outside the box on a lot of things. And if we have to start making cuts by cutting off teachers, we start risking losing that experience. Um, so it's, I think the biggest part was trying to make sure we can hold on to the people. We might have to cut something here, cut something there, but the people are what make the school system and what make the education system what it is. It, you can have all the fanciest stuff, but if you don't have the teachers there to make sure it's implemented correctly, you lose everything. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a popular opinion in this district. Uh, we have some we have some incredible teachers, and I think that uh, the district is pretty good at, at uh, or the community is pretty good at telling them that we have some incredible teachers. Uh, so what attributes or behaviors do you think are essential for board members? Willing to give the, the, give the tough answers. Like I said earlier, if they ask you a question, you, the reasoning might not be popular, but if you can give answers, it helps a lot in moving forward. Um, you've got to be willing to answer the community questions and you can't just be absent uh from everything it's it's they'll they'll send questions and if you if you're not get, if you're not making sure they get an answer then you're not doing your job um making sure their dollars are spent wisely because it, it goes back to the taxpayer thing it's if you can spend the money wisely and still keep the teachers that's the big one um so making sure the money is spent wisely, making sure you hold on to the quality educators that have got the years of experience that you need to make sure the school system work correctly. Um, and making sure that parents have the answers they want. It stinks if you have to send your kid to school, but you don't really know what's going on. I'm fortunate I've got easy access to the school. I talk to the principal all the time whenever I pick my daughter up. He's out there talking uh, or he stops and talks to me. If I got a question the answers it so and and from a school board member perspective that's just as important yes what goes on at the school directs me direct uh, uh, i just had a brain fart i'm sorry um directly impacts me but what i can tell a parent impacts a lot of people so just making sure you're you're talking to parents and finding out what they need and giving them the answers whether they like it or not what the reasoning behind why things are done Okay. Uh, and I know you said that you're overall pretty happy with uh, the Board of Education right now. I wanted to ask if you could make a change or if you could recommend a change to be made, uh, what would you choose? The biggest one would be the curriculum thing. We're making sure that we're not, we don't, I don't know if sell out's the right word, but just sell out for one system of learning with us it's been the math because we're trying to figure this out and when when my daughter was in first grade i had to go to a class to try to figure out how to help her with her homework and when we tried other methods it was oh okay well that's not the way we do it and so we've got like i said we've got a high school student that's coming over and tutoring our daughter i don't want us to buy into one system as the end all be all in any area of the educational system. I want to make sure we understand that students learn differently and that we don't just say this is the way it's going to be or that's the way we've always done it. There's so many different ways that education can occur 
that we need to make sure we're doing what's best for each student as much as possible and not what's just, okay, we bought this thing for a million dollars. Now everybody's got to do it. That doesn't work. Why we would spend a million dollars for a system. I don't, you know, it's, that's a whole different answer, but kids learn differently. I want to make sure we can address that as much as possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what do you think, or this, this might kind of go back to, the, to that answer again, but um, then what do you think is the major issue or issues um, facing either the Fort Simmel School District or public education in general? Uh, as a whole, I think it's that we spend, we send too much money out it's we our taxpayer dollars come together and it gets divvied out here goes to the state and then some goes to the federal and some stays here but then the state divvies out money and the federal government divvies out money i would prefer for our money to just stay where it's at because we don't always school systems don't always get back what they put out because they i understand other school systems need help with certain things but we lose the ability to make sure we get the funding we need by make, having to send all the money out elsewhere instead of it just staying here. Um, and that's at a national level. I like for education to be handled at the local level, not even at the state level. I understand the states, they want to set standards to say this is what the, you know, the minimum is for what we need to get students ready for the real world. But the real world in O'Fallon and St. Peter's, and I'm not sure how far, if we touch any other towns or St. Paul or what, you know, whatever community, the educational needs here aren't the same as the educational, see, excuse me, educational needs in downtown or in St. Louis County, Jeff City, Kansas City, or up in Kirkville. That's the biggest problem I have with education right now is that we can't keep the money where it needs to, to stay at. So we, I think larger school systems tend to suffer a little bit because they've got the money and it goes out other places. Uh, I would like for us to hold on to as much cash as we can to try to keep the budget as consistent as possible so that, you know, this year we've got $200 million and next year we're dealing with a $50 million shortfall. So doing whatever we can to keep as much money in the system as we can so we can make sure to continue operations as they are and improve them as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, so I also wanted to ask, we've heard a lot about um, Fort Simla obviously has some incredible athletes as well as some incredible artists and um, any other and musicians. And so how, how do you think we should balance uh, arts and athletics? Sports are expensive. I was a high school football player, so I hate to see any football disappear. And you lose opportunity for some students to go to college on that. The downside is, is that every, you know, high school football player is not going to get a scholarship. And that's, I think my sophomore year, we had three. And then my junior year, we had two. And then there was a few my senior year. It's it's a great activity and it helps kids stay in shape. They get some interest in other things. It teaches them teamwork. But at the same time, I, it's, I don't want to put too much. I don't want to take away too much from sports, but I don't want to put too much into them because sports are valuable because they've got a lot of things going for them. But at the same time, the arts encourage abstract thought more than football or basketball or you know whatever other sports might be it's it's sports encourage thinking on one level but art encourages thinking on a much different level whether it's poetry or painting or whatever else and it tends to influence the other subjects more because now you've got you've rewired yourself to think a little differently you're not thinking in finite terms, you're thinking very abstract terms. 
I'd like to see more philosophy. I don't even think philosophy was an option when I was in high school. I would love to see that be an option because it's not an art. It's another subject, but it encourages different modes of thinking. If you uh, start reading the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, then you're just like, whoa, you know, those certain things that you, it starts to make you think and look at things a little differently. So if you can start to rewire, I don't want to say rewire, that's a change in the personnel, but if you can change your outlook on certain things through art and philosophy, then some of the other problems start to get addressed. Um, and it's not, you know, a, a definite impact, but I think the arts are important because they do encourage different ways of thinking. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, it looks like it froze up for a minute. <laughs> okay. Did you get my last answer? Did it freeze up on? I think I lost just about the last 30 seconds of it. <laughs> uh, okay. Either way, yeah, art encourages new ways of thinking that it's a big proponent of the arts. All right, great. Uh, so my next question is about budgeting. Um, are there any areas that you would consider off limits that you would never want uh, cut? Uh, teacher salaries to start off with. Um, I think I froze up again. Are you there? Are you there? There we go. Sorry, we made it so far without without the glitches. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I missed all of that. <laughs> okay. All I said was teacher salaries. Okay. That was I didn't hear that. then it froze up. So okay, yeah, teacher <laughs> salaries are definitely off. We don't want to cut them. That's for sure. Because if we if we're holding on to people with the teacher salaries we got, we definitely don't want to lose them. Um, that's the big area that would be off limits um, and making sure we don't, I'm not sure what the, what impact on the budget the cafeterias have, but I want to make sure we don't do anything to reduce the meals. If um, do anything to negatively impact that, because there are kids in the system that breakfast at school and lunch at school might be the only meals they get for the day. So I want to make sure we don't do anything that's going to um impact negatively impact anybody that might be having food shortages or food issues so definitely teacher salaries and anything having to do with the cafeteria are would be my big off limit areas fantastic uh and so i also wanted to ask i just had it up <laughs> uh, i'm sorry i just lost it no oh, no worries um, so how, as a school board member, how can the school board determine if they're doing a good job or not, or if they're being successful in their role? Well, election comes up every two years, so that's definitely one way of, of addressing the issues. Um, but I, I, I don't think there's any way that can't be done to gauge what the people's feelings are on any given day between, between social media <laughs> It's easy enough to send out a survey to the teachers, to the parents, and you don't have to do it across the system all at once. You can do it from school to school just so you can, you know, kind of collect your data up. But you want to check with the administrators at the school, see how they think you're doing. If there's any, if are their needs being met, check with the teachers. How are we doing? Are your needs being met? Parents, how do you think we're doing? Are your children's needs being met? You can do that through Facebook, through written surveys, through uh, not phone surveys, not phone surveys. <laughs> I don't there's think anybody answers those anymore. Yeah, there, there's no way, there, there's so many ways that you can gauge how you're doing and get feedback that is, you know, almost in, it, it can compile the data instantaneously is, are they pleased? Are they not? If they're not pleased, why are they not pleased? What are the big areas that are getting hit on? Why they're displeased with what the school board is doing? Email, you know, it's like I, some people are more prone to sending out emails to school board members than other people are. So it's, it's, you know, let us know how we're doing. More people are, it, people, some people will go to the school board meetings and some won't. Just 
we got you've got to develop a way to get the survey back and collect the data so that you know how everybody feels you're doing and you need to do it through the course of the school year i don't think anybody cares too much during the summer because nobody's there but there's a lot of ways you can do it during the school year just to get feedback and and see what you need to improve on all right uh so i just have about two more questions and then um i'll let you kind of uh just talk a little bit um, so we are, as the Final Light Foundation, we are focused on mental health in the district. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been very apparent this year that there are things that need to change. So my question is, how do you balance student achievement with mental health? Because one of the things that we found is that uh, even students who are considered high achieving are having, uh, are having just as many issues as students who aren't considered as high achieving or maybe are achieving in a different area. That goes back to what we were talking about earlier is that number one, you've got to remove the stigma from getting help. Just because you look like you're doing great on the outside doesn't mean you're not struggling on the inside. The best example is Robin Williams. Whenever people saw him, he looked like he was happy, but he had demons that were, you know, affecting how he was feeling inside. So we can't always judge people by their outward appearances and actions. Um, and just because they're doing well, doesn't mean that they are, uh, they might have, they might school might be their coping mechanism. That's why they're doing well or school. They they're so distracted. That's why they're doing poorly. But the biggest thing we can do is remove the stigma from getting help. Um, letting know if you have a problem, Go to your teacher, go to your counselor, go to your principal, go to the nurse, go to somebody. Let us know you need help so we can get you talking to the right people you need to talk to. It doesn't get the attention that it does in the military because it might not feel as patriotic. Because, you know, they talk about the 22 suicides a day in the military. And the biggest problem the military has had is it's a very male dominated field. But there's a big stigma associated. It's an old school thing is like, if you go get help, you're weak. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Um, Jason Kander, the former secretary of state, he's an Afghanistan veteran. He ran for Senate against Roy Blunt and he was going to run for mayor of Kansas City and dropped out because he was starting to have issues uh, with his mental health uh, related to his service in Afghanistan. But he's very open about this is I went to get help. You got it once you first we gotta let kids know that if you have a problem, you can let us know. Recognizing the problem is the biggest step in addressing the issue. Just because everything looks good doesn't mean it is. And he was, you know, like Jason Kander, he was running for Senate. He looked like he was on a good path politically, and then it just kind of and it just it caught up to him. But he got the help, and now he's doing well, and he still uh, goes out and gets help. I follow him on Facebook. He'll he'll talk about it or uh, Twitter. He'll talk about it regularly. You know about going and getting the help. That's a very big thing for him, and he encourages for, for anybody that needs the help. So the biggest thing is just removing the stigma, and it's hard to do if you don't have a big example out there that can do it, but letting people know is like, just because you talk to somebody doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It just means you need to talk. And sometimes talking is the first step to addressing bigger issues. Absolutely. And uh, so going off of that, we, when we started this uh, over the summer following a suicide, we, we counted over 80 uh, people in the, who had either Active, who were attending school in the district or had recently graduated from the district who died of uh, suicide or overdose. So, and then we sent out a survey where we got some, some more startling numbers that um, about 70% of the students that we interviewed said that they had uh, struggled with suicidal thoughts. So my question for you then is if you were to be elected to the board, uh, what priority would mental health of both students and teachers uh, uh, where would that lie on your priorities list? I'd very high. Um, just because I, I knew soldiers that were in my battalion that were good guys and committed suicide. Um, 
I don't know what all he had going on. And I knew him. He was a good kid. And I, but I only saw him very sparingly. And he went to Afghanistan with us. And I don't know what other problems were, but he always seemed like he was in a pretty decent mood when I saw him. But again, it's, I didn't recognize any signs. So a lot of it is making sure it, it's high because we need to make sure people recognize the signs, whatever that, you know, and it, it's different for a student than it is for a teacher, but making sure we can, number one, get the, the training available um, to help people recognize the signs and symptoms. You know, if you're, if you've got a student sitting by themselves and they were normally, you know, might've been a social butterfly, it's like, hey, are you okay? Or, you know, just sometimes just being able, asking that question to a person and getting them to talk, it's the first step in making sure nothing happens or as little, you, you don't want it to happen. So doing what you can, it's a lot of people commit suicide just because they can't find the help. And they think that is the only way out of whatever pain they're suffering. I can't tell you what one person's going through and it, but it's making sure we can recognize the signs to get somebody the help as soon as possible. It should be a big priority across the board because mental health, again, like we were talking about earlier, it's much better understood now than it was 30 years ago, much better than it was 50 years ago. So we're at the point now where we've got the capability to help people work through their issues. We just got to make sure we can line them up with the resources. And if we can do something early on in schools, especially as the students start getting older into the middle school, later middle school and high school levels to make sure that they can recognize the signs of somebody that's struggling. It's a big step to solving a very major problem. Absolutely. Uh, I really appreciate that answer. So uh, looks like we're getting to the end. So I just want to give you a few minutes to talk to the community as a whole, uh, why they should vote for you or anything else you want to say to them. Well, I won't tell y'all I'm any better than anybody else. Uh, you know, like I said, I got into it for, for basically all for one issue. I was a single issue candidate uh, and it's turned into so much more. Yes, sweetheart. Okay. My daughter's I'm, I'm in the playroom right now. So it, it's, it's, I'm a single issue voter and my single issue is her. Um, cause I want to make sure she's getting the help, getting the education she needs. Um, come say hi. 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 And tell me where you go to school at. Bell, Bell Elementary. Oh, that's a good school. Yeah, she's a little stuffy right now. Allergies are killing. Okay. Go, go finish. <laughs> um, that's, that's my single issue right now. Making sure that she's getting the education she needs. And like I said earlier, if I'm working towards getting her the education she needs, I'm working towards getting other students in the community the education they need. Um, so I guess I am still kind of a single issue voter because that's it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not experienced. I'm a horrible political candidate. You won't hear me asking for any money and you won't see any signs. So it's, it's, I'm bad at running for political office. So it's, it's, and it's semi-political because this is nonpartisan, of course, but um, I work hard. It's, and that again, sounds cliche, but I'll, I'll do what I can to make it as good as I can. Um, I can't make any promises because all anybody ever does is make promises that they fall back on. And I don't, I don't want to be that guy. So I'll, I can tell you, I'll work hard. I'll do the best I can, but that's really all anybody can do. Um, and making sure that, their single issue or their two, three or four issues, whatever, however many they've got in the school system are getting what they need. So, Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's very honest. I really, really appreciate you sitting down with us. Um, before we sign off, I want to remind anybody who is going to watch this that today is the last day to register to vote for the April 6th election. And seniors, if you will be 18 by April 6th, uh, you can register to vote. You can go online. It takes about a minute and a half. And um, the best part, the, be the best way to ensure that you're getting or that you are involved with decision making in your district is to be a part of uh, electing the people making those decisions. Uh, so Dan Hogan, thank you so much again. 
uh, for sitting down with us and answering all of these questions. Well, uh, you have a Facebook that. page, correct? What's that? You have a Facebook page. Uh, do you want to tell people about that? Uh, I've got one and I have not been very active on it. It's like, as soon as I did it, everything kind of got busy. Um, oh, crud. It's uh, just Dan Hogan for FZSD board. And there's nothing on, well, this will be on there as soon as I get to it. And I, I should, I really need to do a little more, but things have been hectic the last few days. So, or since I made it. So, um, that's the only place to find me. I don't have any campaign, uh, any money to, to spend on anything. So that's about it. So. All right. Well, I'm going to stop recording. Uh, probably if I can figure out how zoom works. <laughs> Once again, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> oh, no problem. Happy to do it.